Um, thank you ever so much for coming to the last session on what's been honestly a, a really long day, I'm sure, for everyone from an early breakfast to now. Um, and then we've got the evening festivities tonight, so thank you very much. I'm going to go through some of the upcoming changes that we're going to be seeing in the newer versions of Android. Currently, our Zebra devices are shipping or starting to ship with Android Marshmallow. Obviously, we've got a lot of devices out there at the moment with Jelly Bean, Kit Kat, Lollipop. We've seen a number of changes in the releases that have happened, and we're going to be seeing a number of changes as we go forward. Hopefully, this presentation aims to give you a little bit of information so that when you're designing applications, you can do so with the future in mind rather than coming across problems as they happen. Uh, so I'm Darren Campbell. I work on the architecture team. Uh, I seem to have gone through the agenda before the agenda slide, but never mind. Uh, I'll just a little bit of history of, of how we got there, but I wanted to focus the majority of this presentation on where we're going, particularly some of the actual watchouts and gotchas and caveats in Marshmallow, and then some of the upcoming changes in Nougat or Nugget and O that we need to watch out for. And we have the animation slide. Uh, so Zebra, a lot of you probably know, have been in the Android ruggedized space for quite some time now. Actually started off with gingerbread devices way back in the day. And so obviously we've then had Jelly Bean, Kit Kat. Um, really started off dipping our toes in the water. No one at that point was sure where Android was going to go. Now, as we've all heard, Android is the future of enterprise mobility. So we see a number of tools coming through from Zebra and we see a, a proliferation of Android devices in Zebra's portfolio. Uh, so the lifespans of these devices, just enterprise devices in general, you expect them to last for years. You don't expect the operating system to last for years. Uh, so you might have heard of our lifeguard product, which aims to fill some of the gaps in support. And we've got obviously enterprise grade support services and agreements. When we first started, it was more, are we going to be shooting for one version of the operating system, two versions of the operating system. What we're finding now within the company is devices are being built from the ground up to support not only the latest operating system, the latest version of Android, but two at least versions ahead of that. So we're planning for it in our hardware, but it's also important that you guys plan for it in your software. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's no good loading the new version of the OS on to the system and, oh, now my, op my app has stopped working because we've got doze mode, we've got background optimization, we've got battery management issues. So um, let's uh, just be mindful as we go forward. Also, uh, probably unique to our developers, we have uh, GMS and non-GMS devices in our portfolio. So we've had a whole presentation on that. But again, just bear in mind, there's going to be custom considerations uh, is your application just running on GMS? Is it running on both GMS and non-GMS? What, um, what are the limitations of GMS, the limitations of non-GMS? There are a few out there. And uh, what else have we got out there? So different, uh, different versions as we go forward. Um, I don't really want to harp on about this because I know Chuck gave a, a slide on the, the benefits and non-benefits of GMS. But uh, you, know, you get enhanced location APIs with GMS. Google Maps is a, a free service of GMS. But then on the, on the contrary, uh, if any of you are familiar with Doze mode, and we'll, we'll come into it, so uh, it's a, a mode that the Android operating system will go into to save battery. So on non-GMS devices, that doesn't apply. So we do find maybe some advantages of non-GMS. Um, OK. So it's getting into some of the concerns or some of the problems uh, that our developers have faced as we've gone from, through from Jelly Bean to Kit Kat to Lollipop to Marshmallow. Um, REMDK is our developer framework that we release for Android, enables you to write Android applications on devices. Obviously, we can't support every single device of every generation that we've previously launched, but um, we, do, we do our best. So we but you have the potential of a jelly bean device that isn't supported by the latest versions of EMDK and a marshmallow device that is. So one potential issue, uh, as 
as you move forward with any SDK is does that SDK support all of the devices in your portfolio? So it's, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have both Jelly Bean and Marshmallow. Uh, we do have solutions for customers that, that have such a deployment, but it's just something to bear in mind, not just for EMDK, but for uh, other SDKs in general. So onto the meat of the presentation then, what are some of the, some of the common patterns that I'm seeing uh, as we move forward for Android version to Android version? It seems that every single version has some kind of major or at least noteworthy change to the notifications mechanism. So on the right there, it's a, a, a screenshot. Well, I actually got it off of Google rather than try and find a Jelly Bean device, but this is a Jelly Bean, how the settings notification shade worked. And this has been reworked um, every version, like up there it was the settings with that icon on the right, and then it turned into a little gear icon with lollipop. Uh, you had the two fingers versus the one finger. And every one of those changes makes it more difficult to lock down the device. So in general, enterprise developers don't want to give users access to uh, turning the Wi-Fi on and off or whatever that thing is there, the ringer. You know, they don't, you don't want them to turn the ringer off because then they won't, won't hear their notifications. Uh, so it's, it's quite complicated. If they're changing the UI every release, how do you change the, the way that you limit their access to it? Uh, what else have we got? Yeah, put every release again has uh, changes towards taking flexibility away from developers. So I've mentioned Doze Mode a couple of times. I've spoken with a few customers uh, as I've been at this app forum. It's really impacted uh, some of our developers. But uh, as we move forward with Nougat, they enhanced Doze Mode. With O, they're adding additional restrictions. And we'll get into those further in the presentation. But you know, what's going to happen in, in P and Q as we start developing applications? My advice would be to just follow Google's recommendations rather than try and circumvent what Google have in place at the moment. They're just going to close that loophole in two versions time. And if you still want your application running in two versions time, it, well, it's not. Uh, so just follow Google's advice. And uh, oh, I've yeah, covered locking down your device becomes increasingly complica complicated. OK, another, uh, another animation. So I'm just going to go through the OS flavors, the, the Marshmallow, Nougat, and, and O, and just in a little bit of detail, go over some of the changes that we've seen. Marshmallow, we're starting to have Zebra devices be released with Marshmallow on them. So I can actually give you some, some real data and advice and, and figures on what you guys should be doing. So some of the major changes, if you just go through Zeb, um, I've got links at the back of this deck, but the changes that have been uh, made in Android M, they were runtime permissions, doze mode, the uh, encrypted, because you have full disk encryption with, with Android, the notion of a trusted or untrusted reset, which uh, isn't as well documented, it's maybe has more of an impact to enterprise users, and the, uh, the formal introduction for our devices of Android for work, or what was formerly known as Android for work, now uh, COSU support corporate-owned corporate single use. So dynamic runtime permissions then, this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's been out in the wild for quite some time. I, I guess a lot of you are probably familiar with it already. But this is where an application will present a dialogue to the end user to say, can I have some particular permissions? So in this case, it was, can I access your contact list? And they can, of course, select deny. Well, you don't want your end users to select deny because then you've, they've broken your application. And often that will be your end user's goal because then they can't do any work or it gives them a five minute break as they trunge off to the walk off to the, uh, the back office to get a new device. So the options to circumvent runtime permissions, well, you can continue developing against API 22. I think not a lot of people realize that. They just assumed that on Marshmallow devices, you'd always get these runtime permissions. But uh, no, if you just target API 22, it will work the same as on a Lollipop device. Uh, obviously, you don't have access to Marshmallow APIs. You're somewhat limited there. The second option is Google's runtime model, where they will offer, you know, you, you have to say, have I got this permission? And then if I haven't, then ask for it from the user. You probably don't want to do that in a, a, a deployed application. But as you're debugging, 
then you, you, you don't want to be in a situation where you have to deploy the application in some special way every time you iterate through your code. So it does make sense to uh, include the, the Google runtime model and, and put this dialog up, even if it's just for your own use as you're developing so that you, you don't have to deploy it a special way each time. And talking of deploying it a special way, the MX App Manager. So if you deploy your app through StageNow, if you deploy your, if you install an app through EMDK, either uh, Xamarin, EMDK for Xamarin, or EMDK for Java, it will automatically grant all permissions that you've requested in your manifest. So you don't need to have to worry about it. Uh, and again, like I say, that applies to both StageNow and our, uh, uh, our code access to the MX layer. Fourth, uh, and most recent, if you're using uh, Android devices uh, managed, managed Android devices, then your EMM should have some kind of prompt uh, to, or some selection of, of whether it prompts the user or not. So this is a screenshot from, like Google has an example EMM, I can't remember what it's called, like managed experience, and you can set up your device and it has a few options there. And one of the options is, uh, do you want me to to prompt the user for permissions. And uh, if it's a managed Android device, then those are being deployed through the managed Google Play Store. Those mode then, uh, there is a fair bit of misinformation out there, I think, about what those mode is. It's, it's been around for a, a fair while now, and people have different ideas of, of what it does. Um, fundamentally, Google are, are just trying to save your device's battery life. And, that's not a bad thing. Uh, I think developers were against it because it takes some of their power away from them. It restricts what they can do and it moves more towards what Windows did with the, uh, the Windows 8 runtime model and what iOS do. Uh, but uh, yeah, once you've turned your screen off, if the device is stationary, has to be stationary with Marshmallow, uh, and it's on battery, then after some point in the future, as determined by Google's heuristics, then the device enters doze mode. In doze mode, it loses the ability to maintain wake locks, and Wi-Fi locks, and network connectivity is lost, and just you know your, your application can't do much. Um, so the advice, I think the advice is on the, the next slide here. Um, yeah, if you have that, that diagram should be familiar. It seemed to be in every single blog that came out when Android Marshmallow was released. Uh, so first of all, bear in mind, it does affect only GMS devices. Uh, because Google is so focused, understandably so, on GMS, what often falls through the cracks in the official documentation is AOSP devices are unaffected. So we do have a non-GMS SKU of our TC51, our, our Marshmallow devices. So you know, maybe this won't affect you, and you don't have to consider it. Also uh, impacted are push solutions that don't depend on Firebase cloud messaging. Um, so by and large, if you had a GMS only deployment, then you would uh, be using probably Firebase cloud messaging. It's, it's um, supported by Google, power efficient, has other advantages, particularly when we get to, to N and O. Uh, but you might have, let's say, a mixed deployment. And we've seen this. We have customers with non-GMS, with GMS, and they've said, well, we can't use uh, FCM on our GMS because we want a consistent solution everywhere. So just bear in mind that those kind of, of push, third-party push solutions will be affected by this. Uh, you can, oh, it's a, that's a really small link, but there's a ways of testing. There's like ADB commands you can type in to force the application into uh, sleep mode, you, um, I can't remember what they are, but unplug the battery and then set the device to idle by, uh, by going through the states. Personally, I like to also test by leaving the device idle. It just makes me feel fuzzier inside that I haven't done something wrong with my ADB commands, and I know that the device would have gone to sleep after, say, 40 minutes. Uh, what can I do? Well, there is this notion of whitelisting. So whitelisting is not going to be the solution for everyone. Uh, if you look through the Google Docs, if you're going with the intention of avoiding doze mode because you don't want your device to go to sleep, you still want network access after 40 minutes of inactivity. And you think, right, I'll, I'll whitelist my application. Uh, it, it's, that's not the be-all and end-all. There's still things you can't do. You can't set uh, alarms to fire every second. There's still restrictions on that in doze mode. Uh, there's um, other there's, there's restrictions on whether you can add your application to the Google Play Store. So managed uh, 
managed Google devices, you're a little bit stuck how you're going to get that application to the device unless you're side loading. Uh, but yeah, you, you are able to whitelist. There's an ADB command to whitelist. You can prompt your user to whitelist. Uh, so I do think you, you need to just uh, consider what your use cases are before you go down the path of trying to circumvent those mode. And uh, encryption and adoptable storage. Uh, so Marshmallow was the first Google device which mandated full disk encryption on devices. So in order to pass Google's certification, also all of our devices uh, have full disk encryption. And another new feature was encrypt, uh, sorry, adoptable storage. So if you have a, an SD card, um, you can imagine a very small SD card, uh, put that in the device, you'll get prompted. I think you get like a notification. It says, what do you want to do? Do you want to fully encrypt this card or do you want to just have it as a non-encrypted external storage? Uh, if you encrypt it, then it, it appears to the device as internal storage. You're, you're, able, you're not able to take that card out and put it in another device or read it on a, uh, on a computer because it's encrypted. But you are, let's say you have a huge database and you want, to, to, you, uh, you want additional storage on your device for that purpose, then perhaps this is a use case for you. But be careful, there is duplication with what we offer as Zebra. So this is a really good instance of where Zebra had a solution for encryption called the uh, MX Encrypt Manager. And one of those functions of the Encrypt Manager was to encrypt uh, an SD card. Well, this is almost exactly what Google are now doing with adoptable storage. So it's just worth bearing in mind that as we go forward, features like that where Zebra are duplicating Android functionality, we're likely to move towards recommending the Google solution. But where we offer functionality in addition to that, we will still obviously maintain and obviously there'll be backwards compatibility. So, I mean, in this example, the encrypt manager has folder encryption mode, whereas the uh, it's an all or nothing thing with adoptable storage. So, uh, and it's on Marshmallow only as well. So if you were looking for folder-based encryption or you wanted a common solution across Lollipop, KitKat and Marshmallow, then still the MX Encrypt Manager is the way to go. Uh, and once you start talking about encryption, you start thinking, well, how do I then uh, reboot my device? Am I going to get into a state where I'm unable to recover from a, a reset? Uh, what is the behavior of my device on reboot? In the past, it's not been one of our strongest areas to be consistent across all of our devices on the behavior across each type of reboot. And what we've done in Marshmallow is made a concerted effort to make sure that all of our devices behave the same. So we have different types of resets that you can perform. Um, I'll leave this uh, chart up here. Uh, so you can either just reboot the devices, just performing a, a standard pressing the power button. Full device wipe is it's just going to wipe everything, basically. Everything on the external SD cards, adopted SD cards, internal memory, it just goes. We have a function called Enterprise Reset, which allows you to retain some of your data. The idea there is that uh, you will uh, you, th this is a way to get your device back into a usable state where you can reset it and then hand it out to the next employee to say, right, go do your job. Uh, the, the reason for I've put this slide up here is th this is the way that we envision things going forward. So this shouldn't change, this behavior. It will be the same with NuGet, with O. Um, you know, with this, these are the types of resets. Uh, but do bear in mind that we have the uh, trusted and untrusted factory resets. This isn't something that is very well documented, I don't think. Um, I had to speak to our, our kind of low-level Android guys to properly understand this. So the use case here is uh, my consumer phone. Obviously, I've got my Google account associated with it. Um, I've, you know, Darren Campbell at, at Gmail um, or whatever it is. And you can, uh, if I reset my phone, uh, then if it's an untrusted reset, 
I will be required to re-enter my Google account information in order to get my device back and working. It's part of the startup wizard. I can't bypass that. If I had not entered my Google account information, I just clicked um, ignore for now, then it's not a problem. I can still do an, an untrusted factory reset. Uh, so the, the difference between the trusted and the untrusted, um, trusted resets are invoked from the device settings UI. So settings, reset, um, I haven't done this in a while. I, you, know, you, guys can, you guys know where it is. Untrusted resets are every other type of reset. So including the resets that come from our, our MX layer, the power manager, like I was showing you before with the enterprise reset, uh, and any factory reset packages available from Google. So you can download packages from, from support.zebra.com or whatever the, the address is and, and do a reset that way. So that will be an, an untrusted reset. Uh, I suspect this is an area where we will be improving in the future, but just do bear in mind this difference between a, a trusted and untrusted reset if the end user has put their credentials in. Um, and what else have we got? Uh, so, okay, um, so I'd, we've heard, we've probably heard a, a lot about Android for work uh, in the in the course of this presentation. It's it's an area where. I think there's potential for a lot of confusion. So I, I just put this slide together for my own benefit as well, because I often uh, get confused all these different modes. Uh, so other presentations have gone into more detail here. Android for Work was introduced in 2014. It had support for BYOD. That was the main purpose of, of Android for Work at that point. You had the work mode, there was the profile owner, and it all worked very well and good but it just didn't, didn't really make sense for Zebra devices. Um, since uh, even before Marshmallow, I think it was, then Google introduced the COPE acronym, which was where your corporation owns the device, but it's still personally enabled. So you were the, uh, either the device owner or the profile owner, um, but still you were able to, to, you know, to, to access applications on the device. You were still able to use the device. It was personally, you know, you were a person and it was enabled for you. What we're seeing in six in Marshmallow is the introduction of corporate owned single use devices. So think uh, single specific, task specific devices, single use. These are Zebra devices, all different terminology for the same thing. Uh, the expectation is that these devices will have a device owner. And this is, like I said, a typical use case where your EMM or your MDM is managing your devices. Uh, so from Marshmallow onwards, you can start using uh, Android for Work or you know, the new name for Android for Work in all of your devices. It will just work. It's something that Zebra will be ramping up in the future. Um, it's something that Google are continuing to enhance. Uh, at the moment, I don't think we're pushing it too hard in M, but certainly look out for us pushing it in, in, in future operating systems. But if it's something you wanted to, to play with or to just get an idea of the capabilities, then Marshmallow is a good time to start. Uh, I was actually uh, doing a, a demo of some of the lockdown features in Android Marshmallow. So in uh, a couple of hours ago in, in the room, the room over there, so we had in Lollipop, you had the notion of app pinning. And in Marshmallow, they introduced what they call lock task mode. So app pinning was the ability to just, you know, the use case is you want to give your, your device to a friend so they can watch a YouTube video and you don't want them to browse through your pictures because they're just that good of a friend. Uh, so you, you pin YouTube to the device and give, the, give that to your friend and they needed your, your pin to unlock. What lock task mode is, is really more of an enterprise situation where you go into your next store or your um, Best Buy store and you know, it's a kiosk, that's why they call it kiosk mode. And you would expect your app to, to only show a single or a subset of applications. Now, this isn't the only way to implement kiosk mode. This is the Google recommended way to implement kiosk mode. Uh, if you were at my uh, demo, then you saw there was also, you could use MX to implement a kiosk mode. You could use enterprise home screen or any number of third party home screens offer the same functionality. Um, there is a, a blog, an excellent blog post online uh, that I wrote, I recommend checking that out that goes through the, the different options for locking down your device. But again, this is an instance where Google have 
a system and a recommendation and we have several others from Zebra expect to see some coalescence of all the features and expect to see the, the way forward being like pioneered by Google and we're not going to be going off and forking our own solution. This is what we see as, as the future way forward. Uh, I, was going to, I was going to demo um, the uh, lock task mode. I, I did that earlier on in the other room. If anyone wants a demo, then grab me today or, well, maybe t tomorrow and uh, I'm happy to go through it with anyone. But for the interest of time, and this is the last session, I think we'll, we'll move on. Uh, so on to Nougat. So some of this is speculation uh, based on what happens in the consumer side. And also I've been working with our engineers to understand what they're doing in Android Nougat. But until we've released any devices, obviously some of what I say is subject to change. So if, again, if you go to the Android website for a list of changes in Nougat, then they'll give you a, a whole ream of them. It's quite interesting to look through. Um, I've picked out some of the major ones here which will impact you if you're a, um, an enterprise developer. But first of all, multi-window mode. This is really seen as quite a big deal when it came out because it enables me to, I'm a personal phone, I can watch YouTube on this side of the screen. It's, quite, it's a big phone, it's a 6P, and I can browse Reddit or Facebook on this side of the screen. And beyond um, when it first came out, I've never done that. So I don't know really if, if it's a strong use case that a lot of people are using. Even in the tablet realm, I don't see this uh, being used that much. But in terms of multi-window support, it will work on our Nougat devices. Uh, we're not doing anything special. Only one of the apps will be the foreground app. So if you're doing something like Data Wedge, where you're scanning a barcode and expecting the keyboard input to go to the active window, that will work. Uh, but it could very, be very confusing to the user if they're seeing two different applications, maybe on their kiosk, uh, sorry, on their tablet, they scan, oh, where did my data go? You know, it's, uh, maybe use Intense if you're going down that model. But uh, yeah, we, we will support multi-window. And uh, we're interested, if there are enterprise use cases for it as well, then you know, flag these up, because it's something that we can address. Notification enhancements. Um, this is something that I've, uh, I've enjoyed with, uh, with my personal phone. So with WhatsApp or Gmail, you have this reply in line feature. And uh, you, know, you guys probably are familiar with it. But you get a notification, you can just hit reply right there and the message is sent. It's made me a lot more responsive and, uh, and quicker in answering messages. And we do have a high number of use cases that involve sending push messages to, to people and having them do some action. So if that action is replying, then uh, the enhanced notifications in N are a great way to do that. Bit of a segue, uh, if you were considering going down the managed enterprise route, then you have access to the Play Store. Typically, you would be leveraging the applications within that Play Store. So if you chose to use WhatsApp or Gmail as your messaging application of choice, you don't have to do anything. You just get that for free uh, because you've upgraded to Nougat. So one of the benefits of using managed Android devices. Uh, sorry, just feel like I'm just reading out a list here, but uh, I'll, I'll try and make it more interesting. Doze on the go uh, is essentially just doze, but uh, you, as you're moving, then the, the device will not enter doze mode. The, the advice doesn't change. It li really is the device is more likely to go into doze mode. If anything, it makes the testing easier because you haven't got to worry about leaving it on your desk and accidentally bashing your desk and worrying that it woke the device up and now it's not going to go into doze mode. Um, data saver is an important one. So it's, uh, it's a way for uh, users, end users, if they have access to the settings, and that's the key bit, they can go into the settings and uh, restrict the amount of background data that both foreground and background applications can use. So obviously, like field services or any device which has a WAN connection, more than likely is going to be using applications uh, that require data. It's a very good way for them to, again, break your app or stop receiving messages that you're trying to send them to do more work. Um, really, uh, the only thing to do here is to circumvent the user trying to lock down the settings. So getting back again, my demo earlier on about locking down the device, you can uh, stop the app, uh, stop the user from accessing settings completely. You can access, uh, stop part of those settings. 
Um, just that, that's the way to do it. Tile API, uh, this is, oh, I don't, okay. I'll, I'll, I, I, you, can, you can create, you know, when you pull down the notification shade and you have the Wi-Fi icon and the Bluetooth icon and you can enable and disable them, you can now create your own tiles which uh, actually I, I created my own. I don't have my uh, screen hooked up to do a, a visual um, to show you, but it had like the little zebra head. And the zebra head works really nice as a tile icon because it's already black and white. Um, and you might think, ah, oh, this is great. I can now uh, write a, a little tile and now I can launch, uh, well, they say don't use it to launch applications, but maybe control some settings of my device automatically. Uh, one caveat though, at the moment, uh, and we don't have any plans to, Zebra don't do anything other than completely restrict access to the tiles. So there's not the notion of I only want to show my tile or I only want to show a subset of tiles. Again, if there's the, the need or the want for it, then we may well um, add that feature. But yeah, at the moment, Tile API requires you to give users access to all of those tiles, in including turning Wi-Fi on and off. Uh, number blocking is uh, we, we've had actual real requests from customers to ask us to add the ability to whitelist or blacklist which numbers a device can call or be called from. So there's strong, strong use cases for enterprise there. What Google have done have implemented a very consumer focused number blocking. So anyone that uses Nougat devices, if you get a call, um, Mr. Campbell, you've been involved in a road traffic accident, I understand, you can hang up and write hold on that and then say add to blocked numbers list. The benefit of that is it doesn't just work on the device, it will also send that information to the back-end server, um, well, or whatever the, the, the network providers have at, at their back-end, so that the network providers now know that you flagged that as a blocked number, and they can do potentially other processing, they can stop that number from forwarding to a VoIP account or doing something else clever to try and bypass your blocking and reach you. Uh, the other difficulty, with uh, number blocking systems is just the emergency service numbers. They're different all over the world. They're very difficult to test. They require specialist knowledge. Uh, so see, see that as a, a, an area where Google and uh, Zebra are likely to work together in future to produce an enterprise ready number blocking solution because at the moment it's very consumer focused. Um, okay, new emojis. Uh, I really don't see why we have emojis and why everyone makes a big deal of them. And I was going to make a big spiel about how you should use the enterprise keyboard, a keyboard specifically designed for enterprise. You can have a number format, a letter format, depending on how you want your keyboard to appear to your users. However, we also have emojis on the enterprise keyboard. So um, maybe there is a, an enterprise use case there. I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, we have some new ones. Uh, Web view enhancements, These, this is important for anyone who is writing an enterprise browser application or any other application which uses the web view on the device. So this might be a, a Cordova application, for example, or an, or an Ionic application. Uh, only on GMS, so again, it's, a, it's an area where GMS and non-GMS is diverging. Non-GMS is still going to use the standard Android web view, which is just getting security fixes. Whereas on GMS, you're going to be getting all the features of Chrome. And you have the same version of rendering engine in Chrome as what is being used by WebView-based applications. And this is really helpful if you're wanting to, to debug your application, if you want to make sure your application is um, up to date and uh, deployed successfully. Um, but like I say, well, the downside of that is you have to update the whole of your Chrome APK to get these advantages. And it may well lead to confusion because now we're in a situation where we've gone from Jelly Bean to where there was just a single web view, KitKat and Lollipop where you could update the things separately on the Play Store and now uh, you're updating Chrome and I understand they're adding additional enhancements in, I think they're just enhancements though in, in O, but we'll get to those. Um, there's additional updates to enterprise features, Android for workers and um, you know, they, they, every release they incrementally add new features to their device policy controller APIs, device admin APIs, I think they're called. Uh, just quickly then, 7.1 uh, introduces app shortcuts, which you might think, hey, that's a really good idea. Now I can quickly access uh, or allow my users to quickly access functionality for my app. And uh, yeah, it needs to be supported by the launcher on your device. 
So I, I can't tell you whether the launch on uh, Zebra devices will support it. I would imagine so. But more than likely, you're going to be using some kind of uh, customized enterprise ready home screen, maybe enterprise home screen, maybe some third party enterprise, uh, some third party home screen to lock down your device. They may well not support app shortcuts. So just be aware of that. Um, additional uh, emojis on the keyboard, thank goodness. And uh, they say professional, but it's just pictures of professional people. It's not actual professional use cases being supported there. So just watch out for that one. And uh, yeah, there's a, an intent you can fire in your app to you know, to clear some storage off the device. You probably don't want to let your end users do that um, or give them access to that at all at any point. You know, something you should really be managing yourself. If your device needs more storage, then maybe adoptable storage is a solution for you. Uh, OK, Android O. So recently released as a developer preview. So anything I say here is subject to change. Um, I had a bit of a smile to myself because I, I read the changes and then I watched the YouTube video announcing the changes and then I read the comments on that YouTube video and no one, it was clear from the comments, had read the actual article because they were all just questions um, asking it, silly questions that were already uh, explained if you read the, the full documentation around some of these limits. So it's, it's a good starting point as always, the Android documentation. Um, but if Doze mode was something that's going to affect you in your Android Marshmallow application, then be very wary of some of these changes coming up in Android O. So they've taken restricting what the developer can do and they've taken it up a notch. Uh, so there's limits to what you can do in the background. So a service, so this is an Android service, is limited in how it runs uh, when your application is in the the background. So if it's not a foreground service, so like when you're playing music, that's a foreground service because it has the, the pause button on it, has a UI element. If you're just a background service, then you're very restricted in what you can do there. Uh, in fact, you'll, you'll be killed very quickly within a, a, a certain number of minutes. You can start a background service to handle a pending intent, like if you want your service to handle a notification or if you've been sent uh, an intent directly to your service, then Android will wake you up, but it will put you to sleep after a number of minutes. And this is just a developer preview, but at the moment there's no way of flagging to the system, oh, I'm, I still need to do some processing, I, I still need to do that. Please add me to the whitelist. So in Doze, you could add it with ADB, uh, it, or you could go through the, the UI to add it that way. I haven't seen any way to add yourself to the background service whitelist, so be, be very wary of that and uh, read, the, read the documentation as the O becomes closer to release as well. Broadcast reception limitations. This, it, it's, it's important to know the difference between an implicit broadcast and an explicit broadcast. Uh, so broadcasts explicit broadcasts are only sent to your application. So that's the one where you say com.darrencampbell.application slash dot main activity. I'm going there. Uh, implicit ones are, are things like phone call received or storage mounted where any app can register for those. And Android had a problem where everyone was registering for some of these implicit intents and maybe not actioning them. And so whenever like, storage was mounted, for example, the, every application woke up and tried to do something and it, it was damaging for the battery. So we're seeing that if you want to register for an implicit broadcast, you need to do so dynamically at runtime in a register receiver. So you, you add that broadcast, you can add filter with the broadcast uh, action and, and you know, register receiver and unregister when you get put into the background. Uh, finally, with limits, location limits, uh, if you're running in the background, Android will give you updates every couple of hours, so not very, uh, not very recent. Uh, what, they, they're not very detailed in um, how they advise you to circumvent that. They do say you can use uh, passive listeners, so if you're not familiar, the location API, you, you have a number of... Um, a number of uh, uh, providers. So the network provider is the 
what you get from the wireless and the, the WAN location. The GPS provider is what you get from the, the, the sky gods. And you have a passive provider. And if you say, just give me passive location, then you get whatever location source is specified by some other application that's running on your device. Uh, so they're, they're fine with passive. You can run in the background. And if, they've got, if you've got another application in the foreground, which is getting GPS updates, then you will get those updates at the same rate. But by and large, any kind of application that wants to, like, to, I don't know, like breadcrumbing apps or like, I don't know, find, find my car. You know, I can imagine a number of use cases which are, are going to break by, by some of these background limit limitations. So I'll be interested to see how that develops as we get O closer to release. And again, uh, if any of these, uh, these limitations will affect you and your applications, then you know, please flag them to Zebra. The earlier, the better, because it's something we can work with with Google to help them understand what the enterprise use cases are that require bypassing some of these limitations. Um, oh yeah, I've got a fair bit of time. so. And um, what else have we got? Yeah, additional notification enhancements. Again, same as the, the similar advice there. Uh, you'll, you'll get it for free if you're using a managed um, enterprise device with the, the, the third party applications, but you can like, group them into channels. Another mode, as if there weren't en enough modes, we have, now have corporate owned managed profile, which I. Um, uh, I struggle to get ahead around a bit. This is where you own, no, your company owns the device, so corporate owned, but you still have like a personal area that you own. So this, um, I mean, yes, okay, maybe there's use cases, but it's just another, another thing to understand if you're considering going down the, the managed device route. So that's an area where Zebra are more than happy to help and advise you when you come to those kind of decisions. Uh, finally, then, autofill framework. This looked really interesting uh, to me. This is where you can specify uh, an application and you can say, this is my autofill application. And similar to how Google autofill works, when you go to Facebook or Bebo or I don't know, MySpace, you know, it pre-populates your username and, and password. Uh, well, you can do that functionality, but with native applications, so native text fields. And you can say, well, if my text field is called M underscore name, uh, then the autofill fr fill framework will suggest, oh, do you want to populate that with Darren? And if you say yes, then that can pre-populate my address in that field or my surname in the other field. So that I think there's some good use cases there around, um, around pre-populating some, some enterprise, uh, maybe address fields or, or something like that. So, and uh, like, like I say, additional additions to the web view, uh, like previously, so in N it was using Chrome, uh, rendering engine. Now we start to see some of the benefits of using Chrome rendering engine. So the safe browsing APIs, it prevents, this isn't like a, a, a way for you to whitelist applications. This is just if the user has access to a whole world of, of websites out there, then it just stops them going to anything that might damage your devices, keeping them more secure. And uh, I think, ah, yes, we're done. So I got through that rather quickly. So I apologize if um, I went too quick, uh, but are there any questions at all? Any easy questions to answer? <laughs> um, and I'll be around all of tomorrow. Um, I'll be at the social tonight, so feel free to come up to me, Darren, um, and we can have a chat um, about Android M, N, or O. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>